Chapter 7 of Mari, Our Little Norwegian Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Ingle. Mari, Our Little Norwegian Cousin by Mary Hazelton Blanchard Wade. Chapter 7 Legends. I am afraid I shall have to go to lumbering this winter, said Mari's father, as the family sat around the great open fireplace. Henrik had been home from the mountain pasture for two weeks. It was growing cold, and Jack Frost had paid several visits to the farm already. What a shame it is that the crops turned out so badly, answered his wife. In one more week of good weather, you could have saved everything. Yes, that is true, wife, but we cannot help it. We lost nearly everything on account of the frost. If you are to live in comfort, I must earn money now in some other way. Two of the farmhands can go with me to the camp in the woods, so I shall not be very lonely. The farmer looked around the cheerful room and sighed. Mari went to his side and put her arms around his neck. Dear father, we shall miss you so much, she said. You will come home at Christmas anyway, won't you? Oh, yes. The camp is not so far away but I shall try to be back for one night out of every two weeks. Henrik and Ola will take good care of you girls and your mother, I know. They will be able to visit me, too. They are both good runners on the skis. Although the camp is miles away, it will not seem much to them, eh, Ola? It will be a grand sport, answered the boy quickly. We will run a race to see which of us can get there first. Of course Henrik will win. But who cares? I don't. The two boys had been busy all day making new skis for themselves great sport the children would have all this winter sliding down the hillsides. Coasting on sleds! Yes, there was plenty of that, too, on the snowy slopes around Mari's home. But ski lobing was better fun by far. Mari had learned to slide on skis long ago. They were made from two strips of wood, six feet long, with pointed ends curved upward. When they were strapped on her stout shoes, the little girl could slide over the snow at a wonderful rate without sinking or falling. No, there was no sport like ski loping. Mari had the sled Henrik had made for her two years ago, and her two brothers sometimes dragged her on it down to the village. Sometimes all the children went coasting with their sleds. But it isn't as good as ski loping, they would always say when they came home. And it was no wonder. You would agree with them if you could once see them travel. It was almost like flying. They would stand together at the top of a slope. Ready, Henrik would cry. Then, away! They would all start downwards. It seemed but a second before they were all standing at the foot of the hill, out of breath and rosy as the reddest winter apples. Now for the top, cried the leader after a moment's rest, and up they would go again. It is easy to understand now why Ulla and Henrik were not afraid of a long trip on skis over the snow-covered fields and hills. They were so skillful they would get to the camp in two hours at most. After an afternoon sport on the hillside, the children once more gathered in the big living room. "'Tell us some of the good old stories we love so much,' said Mari. "'There is no one who tells them so well, dear father.' It was the last evening he would be at home. The next morning he must start out for the cold, dreary camp in the woods. Everyone was feeling sad but all tried to hide it and seem gay and cheerful. What shall it be, a fairy story, or a tale of the gods and goddesses in whom the Vikings believed? he asked, when the children had gathered round him, in front of the blazing logs in the fireplace. First let us hear that wonderful legend of the beginning of the world, answered Mari. It is told in the Eddas, you know. Very well, then. Shut your eyes and try to think of a time when there was no earth, nor sun, nor stars, and the great father was all. Mari opened her eyes after a moment and said softly, How lonely it must have been, Papa. A time came, however, her father went on, when all was changed, for out of the thoughts of the All-Father the land of winter was formed in the far north. It was wrapped in ice and cold and mist. Then, far away to the south, rose the land of heat and fire, whose flames never died nor burned low. Now between the land of darkness and cold and the land of light and heat 
there was a great abyss into which the icy rivers from the north were ever flowing. Mist rose from these waters and rushed to meet the sparks from the fires which were ever burning in the southlands. As they met, a wondrous giant came into life, the child of heat and cold. "'Who was there to care for him when he was little?' asked Mari. "'He needed no one, because he was not like ourselves, my dear. Still, he must have food, and so a wonderful cow appeared to give him milk. As she licked the ice from the stones, a new being gradually took shape and arose. He was like ourselves, Mari, only larger, nobler, mightier. He was the father of all the gods, of whom you have read so many stories. I believe you are fondest of the god Odin, are you not, Ola? Yes, father, and it is because so many brave and noble things are told of him. But please go on with the story. You haven't yet told us how this world was made. The gods made it out of the body of the giant, whom they were obliged to kill. They killed him because he grew wicked and evil, didn't he, Papa? Yes, Mari, and that was a good reason, without doubt. The gods now used all their thought and power in making the world beautiful. The mountains that reached up so grandly toward the sky were their work, as were the beautiful valleys, the rivers winding through the green meadows, the rushing cataracts, and the blue lakes. It is indeed a wonderful earth. Round it all the gods wrapped the great oceans which send their arms far up into our shores. "'But how are the stars made?' asked Mari. "'The gods first made the blue heaven, which stretches above us, and dwarfs were put at each corner to keep it in place. Sparks arising from the realm of fire were caught and changed into stars, and they were set on high to give light. A giantess, whose name was Night, had a son called day. The gods were kind to them, and gave them beautiful chariots and swift horses with which to ride through the heavens. Look out of the window, children, and see how bright it is. That is because the mane of Knight's horse is shedding light upon the earth as he travels onward. When the sun and the moon, day and night, were established, the gods set to work to build a home for themselves. They looked about for the most beautiful spot, and decided upon a high plain on the summit of a lofty mountain. The glorious city was built, and the gods settled in their new home. It was the golden age of the world, for there was no sickness, nor death, nor sorrow, nor pain. In the very center of the wondrous city the gods fashioned a golden hall for themselves, and in it there was a shining throne for each one. They had many games and sports in which they vied with each other in strength and skill. They had a smithy, where they shaped iron and gold and silver into powerful tools and weapons. It was here that the rainbow was made, which you see at times arching over the heavens. But the gods were not satisfied. They looked over the earth and saw no living creatures. They said among themselves, We will make the dwarfs, who shall live in the earth and work the mines. But this was not all, for Odin, your favorite among the gods, said to his brothers, Look yonder at those two trees, the ash and the alm, standing side by side. We will make man and woman from them. They shall people the earth, and we will care for them as our children. So it came to pass that our race began to live among the hills and valleys, and has been here ever since. But the gods have never deserted us, but are ever ready to help and protect us. At least all this is what the legend teaches." "'Of course there are no real gods, are there?' said Mari. "'The only gods are our beautiful souls, my daughter. "'They can never die nor do evil, "'any more than these gods in whom our old Vikings really believed. "'The giants are our earthly natures "'that are constantly trying to make us forget our godlike souls. "'But we shall conquer them at last, "'just as the gods always succeeded in mastering the giants, "'no matter how strong or clever they were.' Didn't it take a long time to do it, Papa? The Golden Age didn't last after quarreling began, did it? No. The gods had their troubles and sorrows, as well as men. But, as I said before, the gods always ended by being successful. Are you too tired to tell another story, Father? This time I wish we could hear something about the fairies. Won't you tell us about Ashipaddle? 
Now Ashipattle is one of the favorite of all Norse children, and many tales are told of his wonderful deeds. Which one shall it be? asked the father. The one about his eating with the troll, cried Mari and Ola together. Their father laughed. You are never tired of that, although you are almost a man, Ola. Listen, then, and you shall hear how this brave boy ate with the giant. Once upon a time there was a man who had three sons. The older boys were idle and lazy and would do no work. Their father was too old and feeble to compel them. He had a fine woodlot, and he wished them to go out and cut down the trees. Then he would be able to sell lumber and pay his bills. But for a long time the sons gave no heed to his request. At length, however, they began to listen and think the plan was a good one. The oldest son shouldered his axe and started for the forest. But he had no sooner begun his work upon a big tree than a troll suddenly appeared at his side. "'That is my tree,' said the troll. "'If you cut it down, I will kill you at once.' The boy was terribly frightened, and it is scarcely to be wondered at, for the troll was an immense, fierce-looking creature. Dropping his axe, he started for home on the run, and did not stop to look around till he got there. "'You coward!' cried his father when he heard his story. "'When I was a boy, no troll was ever able to scare me away from my work.' "'I will go,' said the second son. "'I shall not be afraid, you may believe.' He started out with a brave heart, and was soon at work in the forest. But his axe had hardly struck the first tree when the troll appeared before him. "'Spare the tree, if you wish me to spare your life,' cried the giant. The boy did exactly as his brother had done before him. All his bravery disappeared the moment he looked upon the giant." Without stopping a moment, he fled for home and rushed into the house breathless. "'What a foolish, cowardly fellow!' cried his father. "'You are not much like me when I was young. No troll ever drove me away from my work.' "'Let me try, father,' said little Ashipattle. "'I am not afraid.' His two brothers looked at him in astonishment. "'You try, when we have both failed? You who never go out of the house?' What an idea! And they laughed in scorn. Nevertheless, Ashipattle went to the forest. But first he asked his mother for a good supply of food. She at once put on the pot and made him a cheese, for she had nothing ready. With this in his bag, he started out merrily and was soon at work. The axe was sent straight into the heart of the tree, and the chips flew right and left. But just then a deep, gruff voice was heard close by. "'Stop at once!' cried the troll, "'or you shall die!' Now, do you suppose Ashipattle followed his brother's example, and that he fled from the troll? He never thought of such a thing. He did run, to be sure, but only for a short distance to the spot where he had left his cheese. Coming back to the place where the troll stood, he squeezed his cheese with all his might." "'Keep still, or I will squeeze you just as I am squeezing this cheese,' he shouted. It would have made you laugh to see that little fellow talking to the big giant in this way. But the troll was a coward, as all big blusterers are, and somehow Ashipattle felt it. His quick mind told him that he was a human being, and wiser than all the trolls. What do you suppose the troll did, children? He cried, "'Spare me!' with a voice trembling with fear. "'If you will only spare me, I will help you cut down the trees,' he added in haste. That afternoon great work was done in the forest. Many great trees were laid low. The troll had wonderful strength in his big arms, and he showed himself a fine helper. When night came, the troll proposed that Ashipattle should go home with him to supper. "'It is nearer than your house,' he said." So Ashipattle went with the troll to his home in the forest. Before the supper could be made ready, a fire must be made in the fireplace. The troll said he would do this if Ashipattle would draw some water from the well. When the boy looked at the iron buckets he should have to fill, he knew that he could not even lift them. But he was too wise to say this. "'I won't bother with those buckets,' he told the troll. "'I will bring the well itself. Then you will be sure to have water enough.' "'Oh!' "'Don't do that!' cried the troll, in fear. 
for I will have no well left. Let me get the water while you make the fire. This suited Ashipattle, of course, for it is exactly what he had wished. The water was brought, and a great kettleful of porridge was soon ready to eat. So the troll and the boy sat down together at the table. I can eat more than you, although you are so much larger, said Ashipattle to his host. Let us see you try, said the troll, who felt sure he could beat the boy. What do you think Ashipattle did? When the troll was not looking, he seized the bag in which he had kept the cheese, and fastening it in front of him, he slipped most of the porridge he received into that instead of his mouth. At last it was quite full. Ashipattle then took his knife and cut a hole in it, while the troll watched him in wonder. After a while the giant exclaimed, I really can't eat any more. I shall have to admit you have beaten me. Didn't you see what I did? cried his visitor. If you cut a hole in your stomach as you saw me do, you can eat as long as you wish. But didn't it hurt terribly? asked the troll. No, indeed. Try it and see for yourself, replied Ashipattle, laughing inside all the while. The troll did as he was told, and you may guess what happened. He fell on the floor in agony and died in a few moments. And what did our brave little Ashipattle do? He searched for the stores of gold and silver belonging to the troll, and soon succeeded in finding them. He started for home in great glee, for now he could pay his father's debt and free the old man from trouble. Listen, cried Henrik, as his father finished the story. There is a noise outside as though something were the matter. Do you suppose foxes have dared to come near and are disturbing the hens? We will soon find out, cried the farmer, jumping to his feet. Hand me my gun from the wall, good wife, and Henrik, take yours and follow me. They crept out of the house, with as little noise as possible, while Ulla and Mari flattened their nose against the window panes. But it was pitch dark outside, and they could see nothing. Bang! Bang! went a gun. They found him! They found him! shouted Ulla, jumping up and down. I do hope he was hit. A few minutes after, steps were heard coming back to the house. Ulla rushed to the door and opened it. There stood his father, holding a large red fox by the nape of the neck. The eyes of the animal were glassy, for he was quite dead. He was creeping away over the snow when we saw him, said the father, and he had one of my finest hens in his mouth. I don't believe this was his first visit either, for you know, wife, we have lost several fowls lately. Henrik, you and Ulla may skin this sly fellow and make a mat for your mother. But— it is getting late, and I must start early in the morning. So, to bed, one and all. End of chapter 7 Recording by Jill Engel